Hi, good afternoon. Uh, I want to welcome you to Hudson. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Richard White. I'm director of the Center for Political Military Analysis here at the Hudson Institute. And I'm pleased to inaugurate what will be the fourth year of a series of speaking series we've had, a series of panelists, a series of individual speakers on the issue of nuclear security. Um, this series has been, uh, we've been joined with various other groups and it's been supported by the Connect US Fund, which promotes responsible US engagement through grant making and operations to advance critical foreign policy objectives. Um, there's a drive to, uh, to have a, to promote community outreach and community cooperation, so we've had the opportunity to participate along with uh, Partnership Secure America, Stanley Foundation, Brookings, uh, Center for Strategic uh, International Studies, and other groups. Um, a couple of logistics uh, issues. First, everyone make sure to turn off or on stun any communication devices. Uh, we are recording this for audio and visual uh, purposes, so uh, what will happen uh, is that uh, the speakers will make their presentations, and then they'll have some discussion themselves, and then when the audience engages, just, you'll we'll go around with the microphone. So please make sure to wait for the mic and speak clearly and hold it steady so that everyone can benefit from your insights. Uh, if you need to use the restroom, they're actually out there on the left, and there are side doors that you could exit from. Um, there's food in the back, there's drink as well. Um, and now I have the great pleasure to introduce uh, my colleague, Alex Toma, who will tell us a bit more about the Fiscal Materials Working Group and then introduce the speaker. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as Richard said, I'm Alex Toma. I'm the Executive Director of the Connect US Fund and very pleased to um, be supporting this event and many like it, um, also supporting the Fissile Materials Working Group, which is a coalition of over 65 international experts on nuclear security, nuclear terrorism issues. And what this coalition seeks to do is to provide actionable policy recommendations to policymakers both here in the United States, but also across the world. And we do this through events like this, through meetings, through publications, all of which can be found on the Fissile Materials Working Group website fmwg.org, pretty standard. Um, what isn't unusual, unlike that acronym and the website that's linked to it, is um, this issue of nuclear security. It's actually an issue that um, is nonpartisan, actually is bipartisan in Washington, where a lot of things nowadays are not. There are a lot of splits, um, as everyone here is well aware. There's a lot of disagreement here in Washington, D.C., but on this issue, there's actually widespread agreement amongst experts from both sides of the aisle that nuclear terrorism remains one of the top uh, global security issues. Um, if you'll remember back in the 2004 uh, elections, both President Bush and Senator Kerry actually agreed that this is the, this, the one thing they agree on. Um, and certainly President Bush put forward many programs to stem the tide of nuclear terrorism and uh, President Obama has continued that trend. And today we have the very, very um, lucky privilege to have uh, uh, an official from the Obama administration, Laura Holgate, with us, and as well as her colleague, Chung Hee Han, who represents the Korean government, both countries' real leaders on this um, issue of nuclear security, nuclear terrorism, and uh, another wonderful and uh, really experienced guest is Corey Hinterstein, with the Nuclear Threat Initiative um, and a member of the Fissile Materials Working Group. So let me just, um, I don't know the order in which you are presenting. Do you know? Are you We're going not first? presenting. That's right. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, there is, this is another unusual thing in Washington. We are not doing presentations today. Yeah. We are going Lower to do. Lower your speeches first. Ready? <laughs> yes. Okay. We're doing, um, we thought it'd be interesting actually to have a real discussion. And so, um, which is, again, unusual in Washington, D.C., so um, we're glad that you all have agreed to be our guinea pigs today. Um, and Laura, chung -hee, and Corey will have a discussion, then we'll um, bring the audience in um, with some questions uh, and see how that goes. So I think, um, I think Laura will, will kick us off with some provocative remarks. I know Corey is going to um, essentially steer the discussion and almost do like a Q&A style, fireside chat style. Um, and I know we collected questions from... Um, from a lot of different folks through the years, what are the, what are the top questions we have around this issue? So um, let me just present you briefly. Um, so Corey's gonna be moderating and adding the expert uh, perspective here from the non-governmental side of things. And Corey is the Vice President 
of International Programs at the Nuclear Threat Initiative, NTI. And um, she has been with NTI for, I think, five, six years now, six years. And uh, prior to that, Corey was at the Institute for Science and International Security, where she uh, managed programs around the same uh, nuclear security, national security issues. Laura Holgate is the, um, the senior director of WMD Weapons of Mass Destruction, Terrorism and Threat Reduction at the National Security Council and um, has, has also been working on this for years and years. Um, prior to that, uh, Laura was also at the Nas uh, Nuclear Threat Initiative, NTI, where there she was a vice president for Russia and new independent states um, at NTI. And Chung Hee Han is um, my friend, as I mentioned, from the Republic of Korea. He is the spokesman for the 2012 Seoul Nuclear Security Summit, which just wrapped up um, a month ago in March. And um, he's a career diplomat, and his expertise include North Korean nuclear affairs, nonproliferation, and uh, regional architecture in Northeast Asia. So with that, I will let our speakers take it away. And uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Alex and Richard. And it's my pleasure to be here to moderate this discussion. And what we thought we would do is, um, is have a bit of a conversation first, uh, and then we'll open it up to the floor as well. Um, we thought that maybe just hearing more speeches uh, would be uh, too much for here on this Monday afternoon, but um, I hope that we'll ha give our, both of our speakers the opportunity to contribute um, everything that they'd like to say uh, on the issue of the Nuclear Security Summit process and the results of the 2012 Seoul Nuclear Security Summit. Uh, and obviously, if there's anything else that they uh, want to add, we'll give them the opportunity to do that as well. So let me just start, um, in, in fact, backing up before the summit process and noting that this really started, this effort started with President Obama's speech in Prague on April 5th, 2009, um, when he announced, quote, a new international effort to secure all vulnerable nuclear material around the world within four years and we should start by having a global summit on nuclear security that the United States will host within the next year. And we did see that happen, that first summit, uh, in tw at the spring of 2010. So let me start, Laura, with you. How, did, how do you define the four-year effort um, and uh, what constitutes success? Those are questions we ask ourselves a lot. Um, I guess I should make the requisite joke about the hot mic, uh, since that dominated the news of our <laughs> summit in Seoul. But uh, yes, this mic appears to be hot. Um, the, um, the, first of all, I want to emphasize the word effort in the, in the phrase, um, recognizing that nuclear security is never done. As long as materials exist, a security must be applied uh, creatively, responsibly, uh, and in, in, a, in a permanent fashion. Um, what uh, the four-year effort is intended to do, I use the metaphor of a sprint in the, metal, in the middle of a marathon, is to really take advantage of President Obama's personal attention of the moment of international politics, where we can really elevate and upgrade our collective efforts uh, to secure nuclear materials. I think the other important thing about the phrase is it's a global effort. This is not something that the U.S. either has accepted or even has responsibility to do. And so part of getting a consensus and a, and a collaborative effort around that effort was to convene the summit and to bring in more teammates to help uh, broaden the understanding of the concern uh, well beyond that of the Washington Beltway or, or even the, the, the U.S. Uh, itself. Um, we count from 2009 uh, and therefore park the endpoint of that four-year effort period at the end of 2013. Um, that having been said, uh, we certainly are not planning to fold our tent and walk away from the nuclear security issue at that point. But what I really hope we are able to do by 2013 uh, is to identify permanent, either permanent reductions in the nuclear materials threat, uh, which we've already seen significant quantities of in terms of materials reduced, materials eliminated, re materials removed from, from countries, uh, creating uh, 20 countries without nuclear uh, materials at all. Um, the, the other thing that, that we will look to is institutions and the strength of the enduring institutions, whether it's the International Atomic Energy Agency, whether it's the United Nations in its various forms and functions, uh, whether it's national regulatory bodies to really maintain that kind of high quality security that the risks associated with nuclear materials requires. Great. 
And so, Chung Hee, jumping to the summit of this year, um, what what do you see as the main deliverables, the the most important outcomes substantively from the Seoul Nuclear Security Summit? Uh, yes, I I think uh, there are several uh, achievement uh, we can we can think about. First of all, uh, this is an uh, ongoing uh, commitment of uh, the most uh, you know, important uh, level of participation, like summit. Uh, we have uh, 58 uh, leaders, and then this is continuation of uh, commitment uh, on the uh, importance of and seriousness of uh, nuclear terrorism. Uh, I think uh, uh, we got uh, almost uh, over 90% uh, of the achievement uh, ac according to the you know, commitment uh, we had in Washington uh, by uh, more than 35 countries. Uh, and, and second achievement is uh, we uh, put uh, all important aspect of uh, nuclear security. One is nuclear material and the other one is uh, radiological material. And third one is the uh, nuclear facilities. And then fourth one is uh, spent fuel and uh, nuclear uh, waste, uh, and uh, this is very comprehensive approach, you know, to all all, all important area. And third one is uh, we we had uh, Seoul communique uh, with uh, uh, around eleven prioritized area, uh, and with a specific action plan. Uh, particularly, we had uh, two. Uh, different, uh, you know, target date. One is, uh, uh, you know, voluntary announcement of uh, participating countries uh, on the HU minimization by the end of 2013. And second target date is uh, 2014. That is, uh, you know, a target uh, of entry into force of the 2005 uh, CPPNM, uh, Convention on uh, Physical Protection of Nuclear Materials. Uh, so I think uh, the, the you know overall uh, Seoul communique is very comprehensive and then action oriented. And finally, um, I can say that uh, uh, almost all countries pledged specific uh, national commitment, so-called house gift. I think accumulated uh, uh, items could be almost a hundred. Uh, so I think this is very important uh, achievement. Uh, and also uh, 49 countries, uh, you know, presented their progress uh, on their national commitment. Uh, and also this practice will continue uh, on uh, next summit in 2014. And uh, uh, on top of this uh, house gift, another important, uh, I think, uh, achievement was uh, uh, so-called uh, uh, gift basket type of uh, you know commitment this is collective uh, joint commitment by uh, like-minded countries i think uh, we had uh, almost uh, 13 uh, areas uh, on this uh, specific you know uh, issues so i think this is a, a sort of a new type of uh, you know co cooperative measures on nuclear security i think uh, this is uh, uh, if I, I i think i have chance to talk a little bit more i think mm -hmm. this is good achievement great so the coverage of the summit i think was disappointing to some of us in w watching the us media and and i think in other areas as well um, some of the coverage was maybe unnecessarily focused on north korea issue or um, you know the president's uh, remarks the day before the, of course, the hot mic issue with um, his uh, meeting with Ru the Russian president. So um, was there a storyline, Laura, maybe that that was missed that should have been given more importance or that was disappointing that didn't get um, attention either in the media or in the expert community as we've been talking about it um, after the summit? I think one of the most um, exciting stories that has not been covered is the story of uh, the trilateral cooperation of U.S., Russia, and Kazakhstan. Uh, at Deglin Mountain. Uh, this was a project that was so secret that when I came into my position, I was one of only eight or nine people in the whole U.S. government who knew about it. And uh, we were able, uh, because of the personal attention uh, of the three presidents, uh, and in, but also including President Bush uh, before, to really move progress uh, to the point that we could actually make this into a public statement. And this has to do with the uh, understanding 
that uh, despite the work that had been done under U.S.-Kazakhstani cooperation under the Cooperative Threat Reduction Program to seal various test tunnels from the Soviet period, that there were a handful of test tunnels that uh, we, we discovered still had material in them and that the, dis that the process of just closing the front of the tunnels was not keeping out scavengers who were seeking just random copper and iron and things that uh, they thought might be left behind. Uh, what we realized is that there was actual fissile material uh, that could have been stolen. And so keeping it secret uh, while it was still underway was really important. Um, and then the trilateral cooperation among the technical communities to develop special cement, special techniques to actually solidify that material in place uh, and uh, maintaining the security and the security profile in that time frame. Uh, the U.S. Uh, contributed uh, an um, UAV drone to actually provide uh, aerial surveillance of the site. The Kazakhstanis stepped up their uh, activities at the site level. I mean, it really is uh, pieces of a spy novel here, or a spy novel that didn't happen um, in the sense of the, the risk that was there, the collaboration that was there, the secrecy under which it took place, and the acceleration to really get that job done uh, in a timely fashion, and then to be able to take advantage of the summit to really bring that story out. Uh, we had an entire uh, press briefing on it uh, in Seoul uh, that uh, was provided by Ben Rhodes. And of course, the only question that was asked uh, in the aftermath was, so tell us again about the hot mic, Ben. Mm. And uh, it just, it broke all of our hearts. I mean, we even had a three, you know, the three presidents stand up and celebrate this. And it got missed as an environmental issue or as something not, not really recognizing the significance of it. So. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm really proud of the teams that were able to do that. Um, I'm really, uh, I think it's an incredible story uh, of collaboration at the working level and attention at the, at the most senior levels. And uh, the story has yet to be written. So <laughs> uh, there's a lot of people around here in this, in this room who write things. So uh, let me uh, challenge you to uh, bring that story out. Junkie, we, we've heard about successes, um, some less well-known, some uh, that I think got a lot of uh, attention following the summit. Can you talk a little bit about maybe was there a disappointment? Was there an issue you really hoped would be able to be addressed that finally the states couldn't come together on or some sort of missed opportunity at the summit? Mm, I think uh, uh, we achieved almost all uh, you know objective uh, we set up uh, in the beginning but uh, I think uh, uh, if we could uh, make very specific you know, and clear and plain uh, language on, on specific target, uh, you know, date or objective. But uh, I think uh, uh, those languages, uh, you know, have been toned down with, uh, you know, uh, as appropriate, you know, as technically mm. feasible uh, and, and, you know, position to do so, uh, something like that. Uh, but I think uh, in, in this kind of exercise of, uh, uh, 58 uh, members of uh, head of state and head of government. Uh, I think it's difficult to uh, put the uh, you know specific uh, uh, you know high uh, ground of uh, objective uh, with the specific and clear language. Uh, but uh, at the same time, I think uh, we could uh, uh, achieve uh, you know this uh, uh, this object uh, you know target in in many different areas. Uh, so I think uh, it could be, you know, second best. And uh, but uh, originally we are trying to uh, have some uh, common denominator. But uh, we we tried uh, you know, our best to achieve, uh, you know, maximum uh, common denominator in many different areas, not not minimum uh, common denominator. So uh, I think uh, we we could have achieved. Uh, we we I think uh, it's, it's something. Uh, uh, you know, we uh, aimed in in the in the beginning, uh, but uh, I think one uh, disappointment a little bit is that uh, if we could uh, some uh, you know long term vision uh, on uh, nuclear security, what could be our ultimate goal? Uh, uh, you know, uh, with some uh, specific uh, action plan uh, that could give, uh, you know, people that, uh, you know, what uh, NSS is trying to mm. envisage in the future. Uh, so I think uh, this task uh, could be, uh, I think, uh, another important subject uh, to discuss uh, when we prepare the next summit in 2014, uh, because 
you know, uh, third summit, uh, we have to think about uh, what could be our mm. uh, ultimate goal or vision uh, on nuclear security. So, uh, Laura, did you want to add anything? And I, I should say I've encouraged both of our speakers to add something to what the others said or indicate that they want to add something if, uh, if appropriate. One, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, issue did not uh, that much highlight it mm. uh, at the press, you know, uh, on, on top of uh, what uh, Laura said on trilateral uh, cooperation on Kazakhstan, U.S. and Russia. I think uh, there are two uh, specific um, joint statement on uh, uh, LEU uh, conversion, uh, I mean HU oh. conversion okay. from HU-based reactors to LEU-based reactor. One is uh, uh, the project on uh, four countries project, U.S., Korea, Belgium, France, on uh, high density uh, LEU uh, fuel powder project, you know, developed by Korean technology. But I think uh, this technology should be confirmed with the test uh, on the French reactors and Belgium uh, reactors. Uh, whether it could be used uh, to replace uh, HU fuel. So, uh, and second uh, project is uh, another four countries uh, project like uh, US, uh, France, Belgium, and Netherlands uh, to replace, um, you know, uh, HU uh, target, uh, from HU target to uh, LEU target uh, on the Molivden 99 production on uh, medical isotope uh, production. So I think those two areas, uh, high high performance research reactor uh, and, and more than 99 production uh, uh, reactor, I think those two areas are, uh, you know, civilian, uh, you know, HEU uh, using, uh, you know, risk, uh, reactors. Uh, so I think if we achieve, could achieve, you know, good progress on those two projects, uh, we, this can uh, contribute to the, you know, conversion of uh, HU-based reactors to LU-based reactors. So this will contribute to substantially, uh, substantially uh, on the, you know, minimization of HU. Great. I, yeah, I think those two areas were definite, uh, showed real progress. And um, on the issue of HU minimization as a whole, we heard you, what you said earlier about the 2013 um, target date for announcements of HEU minimization efforts. These two very specific projects are both valuable. Um, I had intended to ask about it later, but since we're here, um, what happened to the HEU guidelines? Um, this was an initiative that many were um, pushing for transparency on HEU use in the civilian sector. Um, it's already being done uh, on plutonium. Uh, I think it was a part of the conversation at one point in the summit process. Do you think that um, there's hope for that going forward? Um, I hope there is. This was a, a French-U.S. initiative that had been developed even before the summit mm -hmm. uh, process began, and uh, there it looked like there was an opportunity to use the summit to promote it. Um, the, for reasons I don't fully understand, um, the process by which the plutonium guidelines were developed was considered quite politicizing by some uh, within the IAEA who felt that it was a fait accompli, uh, sort of applied to the agency without the full involvement of the uh, full members uh, who, had, uh, who, who might have had an interest in helping define it. And that when the French uh, first brought their proposal for HEU guidelines into the summit conversation, they said, and we'll do it just like we did the plutonium guidelines because that worked so well. And that prompted a very strong reaction from some of the more vocal members of the non-aligned movement who said, no, in fact, that was not a good way to do mm -hmm. it. And if that's the way you're going to do it, we don't want anything to do with it. Um, so the French, I think, retreated um, from that procedural point without ceding the, the value of having some kind of a, some kind of a public statement uh, about holdings and intent and, and eliminations and so on. Um, but then when they went to, you know, Demarche, various countries, that they, they kind of had their sense of who needed to be part of that process, and they, they didn't get uh, support from everyone that they felt was important to kind of proceed with that. Uh, so I think that combined with uh, some very vocal opposition uh, within the, the uh, summit process uh, prevented there from being a consensus on that particular thing. There is a vestige of that idea 
in the communique uh, language. I see Chung Hee has the language in front of him, so I don't. I won't uh, try to repeat it um, from memory. Uh, and it may allow it to proceed. Mm -hmm. But I think one other interesting thing that happened was that there was a, a playoff um, between the uh, well. The, the reality is that that most of the highly enriched uranium that's not in the P5 weapon states is already under safeguards and is already being reported to the IAEA in some form. So a lot of countries outside of the P5 felt, well, what, what's the value added? And the, 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 the only answer to that is, well, the, value, the thing that's different is the, is the public nature right. and the transparency that goes along with it. And that fought a little bit with this uh, strain of discussion that the British had injected into the summit conversation, that there was a lot of ultimately consensus around of the importance of security of nuclear uh, security related information. And so there was kind of a debate about, well, is there really security value of being more transparent about holdings? And uh, ultimately, uh, there, that, that kind of got mixed up with the procedural debate in a way that uh, didn't... Uh, didn't carry the day in yeah. the way it had initially been uh, considered. Which is too bad, considering that, you know, many of us believe that security and transparency are not mutually exclusive, and in fact, confidence in security can be greatly enhanced by greater transparency, but um, it's a conversation to continue to have. Chung Hee, you had uh, something? Yes, uh, the, the final language in the Seoul community on the HU guideline uh, uh, reads as follows. We recognize that the development within the framework of the IAEA of options for national policies on HU management will advance nuclear security objective. There is no specific language on the uh, HU guideline, but uh, it, it, it turned out to be uh, like this. I think uh, uh, the HU uh, guideline on management uh, is important uh, in that, uh, you know, we have, uh, you know, one uh, important area of minimization. You know, this is physical reduction. But at the same time, uh, we have to manage properly on the existing HU uh, holdings. So I think uh, this will, uh, any anyhow, will pave a way uh, toward, uh, you know, uh, initial discussion uh, among uh, members of, uh, you know, participating countries, but under the uh, framework of IAEA. So I think uh, France is leading uh, this area. Mm -hmm. So at any moment from now on, uh, you know, with the leadership of France or, or any other like-minded countries can continue uh, to discuss this issue uh, in the framework of IAEA. Some countries, I think, have been criticized for not bringing important enough house gifts to the summit process. and um, and. You know, for an outside observer, certainly you look at the list, and while all commitments are important, all commitments have value in particular to the countries making them. You know, some countries still have made little to no new commitments through the summit process, and others, I think we can say, you know, not all commitments are created equal um, in, in the sense of, of the real tangible nuclear security improvement. Uh, so I guess one question is, you know, how do we better engage countries that either haven't brought anything to the summit process or maybe haven't brought um, the commitments that are commensurate with the responsibility that they have, either because of where they are in the world, the role they play, the amount of material they have. Uh, you know, we speak in code. Russia has been criticized, um, but they're not the only ones. Um, so are, are there ways to better engage those countries or is the summit, you know, not the place for that and in fact just reflecting the overall dynamic? Yeah, uh, as, as I said, uh, you know, the present uh, reporting uh, presentation by each country, uh, this uh, practice I think is important. At, at Seoul summit, uh, as I said, 49 countries, uh, you know, uh, uh, presented their uh, national progress report to the chair countries, and we put that uh, thing in in the website, official website. I think uh, this could be a uh, you know good sense of responsibility you know to to do something. Um, uh, I think uh, you know in next two years this practice will continue. So almost all partic participating countries will have some uh, you know feeling of burden uh, and responsibility to do something uh, based on uh, you know their national commitment. 
as well as uh, you know uh, the, the the commitment in the Seoul community. So uh, and also, uh, as I said, uh, you know, an HU minimization, civilian HU minimization, and conversion could uh, uh, have also uh, you know uh, a forcing uh, effect to the other countries, like uh, even you know, including a P5, uh, you know, to uh, to 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 do something to minimize their own uh, holdings on HU or, or plutonium. So I think, uh, but this is a virtue of uh, you know uh, this kind of uh, summit meeting. Uh, even though there is no any binding uh, you know specific uh, obligation or, or 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 legally binding effect, but I think uh, the presence of the you know heads of state and heads of government will give a very uh, strong political uh, burden uh, of responsibility to the all participating countries. You know, I think uh, when they come to the you know, summit in Seoul as well as in uh, Netherlands, I think they uh, will feel uh, you know, more uh, strong uh, commitment even, even than uh, you know, legally binding things, I think. Laura, I, I know in the 2010 summit, one of the biggest challenges was getting consensus even on the threat, um, that a lot of states came to the summit even without buying in completely to at least the U.S. assertion of the reality and urgency of the nuclear terrorist threat. Um, have you seen that change in the lead up to the 2012 summit? And I guess, you know, how do we, how does the summit, how has the summit process contributed to that changing perception if it has, um, and how do we sustain attention uh, without being the boy who cried wolf on nuclear terrorism? Well, I was personally really intrigued by the um, kind of increased specificity and tangibility of the leader's own interventions um, based on uh, compared to, to the Washington event. And that's not to be critical of comments made in Washington, but I, I think in the two-year period and the process of preparing for the second summit um, gave leaders a reason to ask their own agencies and their own governments and, and their own experts you know, what, what is this issue? How does it affect, um, you know, my own national responsibility to protect my people and to be a good neighbor on the planet? And the, um, so I think there's, there's more of a personal engagement than we, we saw when we first launched this in, in 2010. Uh, I hope the, that that will uh, proceed and, and continue uh, in, into 2014. Um, I do think it continues to be the case, however, that the Sherpa community, with a few exceptions, is primarily a diplomatic community. They're not a security expert community, and they're not, and they're not an intelligence-driven uh, community. And so there are moments in the negotiating process <laughs> where uh, that the, the debates over the, you know, as appropriates and the, um, you know, where justifieds and all the, mm -hmm. the, the common caveats that uh, are sprinkled throughout the communique start to become the battle and, and kind of losing track of, wait a second, we're here to protect humanity from a nuclear attack. <laughs> this is a very, uh, you know, real threat. Um, and, you know, we were, every now and then, some of our Sherpa friends, uh, would, would bring us back uh, to that reality and would react with some impatience to the, the kind of micro level uh, of discussion that had, the diplo babble that it had evolved into. And so I think um, it, while at the expert level, I think the, the understanding of the threat remains uneven, um, I think it is enough to keep us moving mm -hmm. and enough to keep the process going forward. No one has opted out of the summit process. No one has said, eh, not my problem. I'll go worry about climate change over here. Um, but, um, so I think it's okay that we don't have perfect consensus, much as it would be nicer if there were more of a sense of urgency, particularly among some of the countries that you hinted at earlier uh, in your earlier question, who are not perhaps, uh, showing up as much of, as the stars of the show that, yeah. that one might, one might wish. Uh, chung I'd like to talk about broadening the effort a little bit beyond kind of the narrow focus of these two summits and what how the outcomes have been crafted what needs to be done in order to ensure follow through and i and when i say follow through i don't mean with you know each individual specific commitment because those are kind of easy to track either the material's been removed or it hasn't the facilities converted or it hasn't uh, a treaty has been ratified or it hasn't but rather you know both of the communiques 2010 and 2012 
embodied and contained some broader principles. Um, and how do we move forward on building around those broader principles? Uh, yes. Uh, actually, this is everybody's, you know, uh, agreement that the uh, nuclear security area compared to, you know, other area like uh, safety uh, as well as safeguard, uh, you know, this nuclear security area uh, is a, a sort of emerging issue. Uh, this is not, you know, uh, yet uh, getting at uh, very, uh, you know, confirmed and uh, uh, and solid uh, standard or, or, or regime. So I think uh, this is an emerging issue. Uh, and in that sense, uh, you know, two summit and also scheduled third summit, uh, three rounds of summit uh, will help, uh, you know, contribute uh, to the, uh, you know, a growing uh, uh, issue on uh, nuclear security. Uh, and also, this is a really important challenge to international security and peace uh, uh, now and 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 in the future. So, uh, uh, but uh, I think uh, those uh, three rounds of uh, summit uh, is not that much sufficient, you know, to achieve uh, what we expect in the in the future. So, I think uh, we, uh, with this uh, uh, highly political, uh, you know, commitment by the leaders. Uh, we have to uh, utilize, you know, this uh, good opportunity to uh, materialize, uh, you know, the the structure and and also standard of uh, nuclear security uh, in the framework of uh, existing, uh, you know, uh, mechanism like IAEA and the United Nations and also uh, uh, GIC and Global Initiative to Combat Nuclear Terrorism. Uh, as, as much as possible, uh, so that uh, you know, even though uh, this uh, NSS process, uh, you know, could uh, disappear uh, sometime in the future, but I think uh, this uh, our uh, common objective, like uh, you know, making standards, uh, and also as well as uh, you know, uh, establishing a peer review mechanism, uh, and also uh, you know. Uh, what could be each nation's uh, responsibility, you know, to reflect some uh, specific regulations, uh, internationally standardized regulations to their domestic laws and regulations and practices. So uh, I think uh, uh, this is our, should be our ultimate goal uh, uh, and to make a very uh, strong and uh, robust uh, international nuclear security or global nuclear security governance or architecture uh, so that, uh, you know, uh, this issue, nuclear security, should be, uh, you know, a firmly established international norm uh, like uh, nuclear safety and nuclear safeguard. So I think uh, we have a lot of uh, work to do in the future, you know, not, not just even having, you know, summit uh, in 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 two years' time, so I think this is a challenge or, or objective we have to achieve in the future. Yeah, Laura, let me play on that and ask you a question, um, which is, you know, in in her remarks in Seoul, Australian Prime Minister Gillard said that we should be working towards something um, of an accountability framework that would include regularized peer review and and other elements. So, I mean, is this is this desirable? Do you think there's support for it? Um, are there ways to pursue that objective in a positive way? Are there ways that could actually be harmful? How, how do you react to this uh, initiative? I think it, there is a risk if you start uh, too much with an accountability concept or a, even, a, dare I say it, a verification concept. And that it really, I, I think Chung Hee hit it right, is the concept of peer review and kind of responsible behavior for yourself um, and responsible behavior as a partner. In, and you can think about this in a whole range of different kinds of partnerships. For example, with the United States, when we enter into an agreement for nuclear cooperation, one of the things that we insist upon is that if, if you are going to receive material provided by the United States, that you secure it to the, the, the current IAEA um, guidelines uh, for nuclear security. And those guidelines were just upgraded, and then we're in the process of figuring out how do we, how do we help our partners adjust from you know, the previous standard to, to the current one. 
Um, but what that means is that 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 notion of the of the standard gets built into our or standard in this case the, that that, that uh, basic understanding gets built into the cooperation. And then you could think about saying, okay, well, one way to make a judgment about that is for the U.S. team to go visit. Another way is to have an international peer review come and visit. Uh, an IPASS mission or some other kind of a IAEA provided uh, expert review. You could even think about incorporating that, incorporating that into business contracting. Certainly part of a due diligence is one enters into a partnership or a sales relationship with, with some other entity, particularly in the nuclear area where reputation is so important, is to have some confidence or put in some pieces in place that give you confidence that your material or your equipment or your technology will not contribute however inadvertently to an accident or a theft or some problem at that other site that they couldn't redound upon you from a commercial point of view. So maybe country uh, companies that start to, that are doing internationally um, connected business can it, uh, expect a, an IPASS mission or some kind of an international peer review that gets built into that um, business decision. Um, so there's a lot of ways that I think you can incentivize, and I think it's the incentivization process more so than any kind of imposition uh, from a global regime uh, as such that is going to get us where we need to be at least in the next little bit. Now, um, you know, there's Igor Kripanov has done a lot of interesting work on how soft law becomes, how, how a norm becomes soft law becomes hard law. And I think we're looking at the beginnings of a norm here and it, we're quite a ways away from law, uh, but you don't get to the law, uh, you know, from, from nothing. Well, let me push on that a little bit because uh, on the one hand, I think what you're describing is a mechanism that could help us evolve from where we are to where many of us think we should be. At the same time, I think it does overlook a little bit um, the, the sense of responsibility. So there, I think there are two sides to the coin. One is what do we, um, what do we impose? What do we expect of others? Is it based on, on the confidence that they would like to grant the confidence that they want to show to others, or is it based on a, a responsibility they have to show um, their good custodial management, their good that they are, you know, showing good practice? I don't think that norm has been established yet. So I, I, I think it's a, something to aim for and something that could be developed mm -hmm. out of this process, but I don't think we can rely on it uh, as a basis for, for current behavior. Let me talk a little bit about the process. I think um, in, for many of us looking at this at the summit, um, you know, the, the Sherpa, Su Sherpa, Yak dynamic, um, for those who are familiar, you know, the head of delegation, the Sherpa, the, um, what many would say, the uh, people who do all the work are the Su Sherpas, um, and the Yaks are the supportive team around them. Um, it's, it's really added to the unique character of this particular summit process. Uh, certainly Sherpas have existed in other, in the G8 context, for example, but um, but it's been more than just having a Sherpa. It's been this ongoing engagement, the, the intercessional meetings of the Sherpas, the meetings of the Sioux Sherpas around the world, um, the building of the summit community. And I would, um, I actually have noted that this is something I think is a success of the summit, which is capacity building in countries that had never really focused on this. The fact of having to build these delegations and have them be sustained in an ongoing way and attend regular meetings and have these conversations, I think has help build capacity. So um, that, I, I'm just wondering, uh, maybe Chungi, you could say something about how that process has contributed to the, the success of these summits. Um, and, and the second part of the question is really, it's already being cited as a model for other issues. Uh, do we have, should we replicate this model to address other important international, difficult, multipolar issues? Um, is there something unique about this issue, or, or can it be replicated, or should it be replicated? Uh, first of all, uh, the system of uh, Sherpa, Su Sherpa, and Yak uh, is, is, I think, very uh, productive uh, in, in Nuclear Security Summit uh, discussion because nuclear security uh, is combined with a very, uh, you know, different, uh, you know, element, uh, ingredient, like a political uh, aspect, as well as uh, law and the technical aspect and also uh, training, education, and culture, uh, including. So I think it's, it's very comprehensive, particularly there is very technical uh, aspect. So uh, for the summit, uh, I mean, head of uh, state and head of delegation, 
uh, it's difficult to you know grasp uh, what the nuclear security is all about. So I think this is a job and responsibility of uh, Sherpa and Su Sherpa to uh, you know uh, put uh, all ingredients uh, in 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 a very comprehensive way, and then uh, you know explain uh, to their uh, heads of state and head of government. Uh, what is the you know priority? In, what is the importance of this issue, and uh, what uh, should be done, and what what could be our our country's uh, specific commitment uh, in this context? So I think uh, the role of uh, Sherpa and Su Sherpa uh, is very important, and also uh, uh, as I said, we in Seoul summit uh, around uh, more than ten uh, you know issues uh, on specific issues. Uh, you know, uh, with a joint statement, uh, with gift basket. Uh, this is like around uh, uh, 15 countries and 20 countries have specific uh, commitment on specific project like information security and uh, counter smuggling issue and radiological security. So uh, from now on to the uh, next summit in 2014, those issues should be uh, discussed and addressed to find out, uh, you know, specific, uh, tangible and deliverable. So I think uh, this is work of also uh, Sherpa and Su Sherpas and Yaks, uh, how how to, you know, come up with a specific uh, result. And also, uh, finally, uh, uh, as I said, uh, what could be our future uh, goal and vision on nuclear security, uh, regardless of, uh, you know, this kind of summit process. But this is another, you know, responsibility and work of uh, Sherpa and Su Sherpa and and Yaks, uh, so that uh, you know uh, heads of state can decide uh, based on those, you know, uh, preparation. And also uh, regarding the model, uh, uh, this nuclear security summit process, uh, I can say that this is a very, uh, I think, a selective uh, issue, specific issue oriented and the uh, limited uh, time uh, framework uh, uh, of multilateral you know summit uh, process uh, so i think this uh, like g20 uh, financial crisis summit i think this is very similar approach in addressing very urgent uh, global and important issue so uh, and also uh, this kind of system of shepa uh, shepa yeah to prepare uh, without any, uh, you know, administrative, you know, red type. So simply with the work of, you know, Sherpa and Su Sherpa group to report directly to the head of state, you know, what we discussed and achieved so that they can decide uh, in a very uh, quick process. Uh, so, you know, this could be applied to other issues in a globally very sensitive and urgent issue to uh, make a very quick decision by the you know, uh, like-minded countries, uh, you know, uh, as a thing. Yeah, Laura, I know since you're, you kind of created some of this process um, by being the Sioux Sherpa for the first summit and um, especially the idea of house gifts and then the building on that for gift baskets in this last one, I think, chung you make a good point that it's not just uh, the commitment that was made, the fact of these gift baskets has created, I would say, almost de facto working groups. Uh, between now and the next summit, which, you know, hopefully will ensure some tangible outcome. But, Laura, what uh, what did you want to add on that? Well, I just I wanted to add, first of all, that we should give due credit to the G20, which actually invented not just the Sherpa and the Sioux Sherpa, but the yak uh, phrase, and even my counterpart at the National Economic Council, or at one of my uh, former colleagues, had yak on his business card. <laughs> okay. um, so we uh, leapt in with both feet uh, in embracing that nomenclature. But I think I just want to emphasize and then expand on a couple things that Chung He said, is that by creating those, in some ways, nonsense titles, it allowed each country to assemble the delegation that it needed, uh, recognizing that how, how governments organize around this issue is not identical. Um, in fact, I lack counterparts in most, a direct counterpart in most of the 53 countries that attended uh, the meeting in in Seoul. And in fact, Chung He in other lives would not, and I would not be counterparts. Um, and uh, so, first of all, I'm really glad <laughs> that we got to be <laughs> counterparts, but um, it gives me a way to engage with, um, with, with others who have similar responsibilities, similar interests, um, and that, that who are themselves empowered by the summit process. And I'll just tell a little story um, about uh, the, uh, something that grew out of that, uh, which was a, an effort between 
um, the U.S. and Japan building out after the last summit where we actually created a nuclear security working group that was nominally headed by the two Sherpas and on, in terms of the real substance of it is, is uh, headed by, by me and my Japanese counterpart who's in the foreign ministry. Now normally the Japanese foreign ministry doesn't have a lot of ability to convene their fellow agency players. Now, you know, that's my bread and butter. That's why the national security staff was invented was to help do that coordination. So um, they didn't really have an analogous entity. And so now that, that, that empowers my, my, uh, my Japanese Sue Sherpa friend in the foreign ministry to get the cabinet office present, to get the regulator present, to get the MOD, the Coast Guard, the national police, uh, the technical uh, uh, nuclear community around a table. And we've, got, we've made enormous progress in the last two years. And that was one of the, I guess I should say, one of the unsung, uh, I think, successes of the, of the summit was there was a joint statement that identified uh, across nine working groups that we, the U.S. and Japan have on nuclear security steps that we've both been taking to enhance our cooperation and our security postures in the last two years. Uh, so I think there's some interesting relationships that this slightly um, uh, invented <laughs> uh, superstructure has allowed us to carry out. Well, I'm um, going to give our audience uh, a five-minute warning that I'm going to ask a couple more questions and then and then open up the floor. And I, I do have more, but I think that people would rather, um, I, I'd rather hear from you than hear myself uh, ask more questions. Um, but uh, I'll fill in the silences if, um, if you let me, and I, I warn you not to let me. Um, so I, let's, let's turn to the future and looking toward the 2014 um, Netherlands summit, um, I believe will probably be a Hague summit, but I don't know uh, if they've officially decided that yet. Um, Chunghee, you're coming off of being, you know, the most recent steward of the process. So um, how, do, how do you see the goals uh, for the 2014 summit and how, what advice are you beginning to provide your Dutch counterpart? Uh, I don't envy, you know, <laughs> 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 Netherlands, <laughs> my counterpart. <laughs> Uh, I think uh, they have a lot of uh, uh, work to do. Uh, first of all, uh, they have to check whether uh, the commitment in Washington communique and Seoul communique, uh, you know, could be uh, achieved uh, in a very proper level by all participating countries. Uh, you know, I think uh, with the National Progress Report uh, and also. Uh, Particularly, they have to check, you know, those two target dates, as I mentioned, on uh, CPPNM as well as the HU minimization. And also, uh, even though those, uh, you know, joint uh, statement on gift basket is a voluntary, uh, uh, you know, commitment and exercise by participating, I mean, like-minded countries, but I think as, as a chair, uh, they have to uh, encourage, uh, you know, those development and also, uh, uh, you know, oversee what is going on, on on those specific issues, because I think those areas are very important uh, element of the, you know, success of the next summit. Uh, and also, uh, the task of, uh, uh, you know, Netherlands summit is, uh, we have a four years, you know, effort, and also, uh, you know, 2014 is anyhow very important timing to see uh, whether our uh, joint effort during last four years uh, really uh, has uh, some uh, substantial achievement, uh, you know, approaching our objective. Uh, and, and finally, I think, uh, as I said before, uh, what uh, I think the, the responsibility of Netherlands uh, Summit is uh, what, what, what is our, uh, you know, uh, ultimate goal uh, on nuclear security? Uh, what is our vision, uh, you know, to uh, structurize uh, this nuclear security? So I think they have to say something, uh, uh, including uh, whether this summit process will continue or not, you know. So uh, I think this is very important task uh, they have to, uh, you know, take. Um, and I think they have to say something on, on the, you know, future process of a nuclear security summit. 
based on uh, you know framework of uh, uh, you know long term uh, perspective and long term vision of nuclear security uh, among uh, participating countries in, in within that context uh, they can say that you know uh, this process will continue uh, or not uh, so uh, anyhow uh, even though we you know discontinue our process after 2014 i think we have to tell uh, to the participating countries as well as the international community that uh, we are preparing something you know some uh, replacement very uh, strong and you know almost uh, you know parallel replacement mechanism to continue uh, our work on nuclear security so I don't have any specific idea what, what that uh, replacement mechanism, but I think uh, we have to uh, uh, make something, you know, to continue our work uh, without any, you know, disruption or, or, or discontinuation. Laura, I'm interested in your comments on the same question, and I'll add a layer based on what Chung Hee just said, which is, you know, should or do you think there's value to continuing the summit process past 2014, or are we thinking about moving into a different structure, um, I think most of us would hope that there would be something, some sort of mechanism that would be lasting out of this. But uh, what, what, is your, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I think the, um, the real issue, and, and Chung Hee mentioned it a couple times as well, is this institutionalization of the progress uh, and the momentum that we've achieved. Um, and if we think forward to 2014, what will we want to have accomplished in the last, in, in the intervening two years, in terms of really beefing up the IAEA's ability to live up to the expectation that 54 of its member states have brought forward to it, uh, to take a much more active role on nuclear security, to help coordinate other international activities on nuclear security, to help coordinate national activities, for example, this new network of the the uh, nuclear security support and training centers. Uh, that ha are they not centers of excellence anymore? Well, <laughs> they're definitely centers of excellence. Okay. They've always but But actually, even before the con concept of centers of excellence mm -hmm. was invented, the IAEA was building these nuclear security support centers uh, in countries around the world, including some that weren't part of the summit process. Right. And so in an effort to be uh, to really broaden uh, the connection, um, I think the, the decision of that group was to go with the existing phraseology, recognizing that it absorbs and includes the uh, co concept uh, that was kind of associated with the 2010 summit of centers of excellence. Um, anyway, bottom line is the 54 member states expect the agency to really step up. And are they going to use, are they going to behave that in Vienna? Um, we found some instances of disconnect between voices in our summit process and voices around the bog table uh, in Vienna. We hope to repair some of that. Um, but it's not just the IAEA, it's the UN. And uh, you know, the, how do we take advantage of this renewal of the 1540 committee, its uh, establishment uh, in a slightly new format, uh, the change of leadership in the UN Office of Disarmament Affairs uh, to uh, perhaps uh, expand and, and enhance the, 15, the role that that uh, tool and that committee plays in um, the sort of institutional support for this kind of activity, among others, obviously 1540 is much broader. Um, looking at uh, voluntary institutions such as the World Institute for Nuclear Security and how can its membership be enhanced, its, its best practices uh, mechanisms be broadened. Um, I, I was really pleased that they were able to take advantage of the platform of the summit to pull together some of their best practices into a compendium and make that available to all summit participants. Um, I'm sure that's available in other, to others who may wish, so um, that, that's a, a resource for, for folks here as well. Um, so I think there's a lot of, a lot of tools that if we uh, are, are intentional about it and we say, okay, we really do want to institutionalize this momentum or take advantage of the momentum and build it into something, because ultimately we do need this to be a much more global enterprise. Um, I mean, Chung Hee has accumulated a number of facts and figures about the characteristics of the 53 states that were involved in terms of their representation of, you know, the global population, global GDP, global holdings of nuclear materials, and so on. I think we've got most of them. But there continues to be this legitimacy issue um, that I think can be enhanced by moving this issue more and more into the global structures that were designed to contain it. Um, and to ask more of those structures as, it, as participants within it to do 
uh, to do the necessary uh, in these regards. And I don't want to leave out national regulatory processes here. Um, one of the thing, one of the U.S. House gifts uh, that we are bringing forward is the first ever international conference of nuclear security regulators that the NRC will be hosting later this fall that will emphasize the, the, the national regulatory uh, component of this overall nuclear security uh, architecture, if you will. And, you know, those are some of the most durable uh, changes one can make. It brings the force of law. It brings, you know, there's no one that, that denies the legitimacy of a state to uh, hold its uh, citizens and its companies accountable for behavior, to punish them uh, if they misbehave, and so on. So uh, affecting this issue at the level of national regulations uh, can be one of our most uh, important and lasting uh, out outcomes of these kinds of issues. Yeah, can me. I uh, add a couple of points uh, regarding uh, the future of the Nuclear Security Summit? Mm, actually, uh, you know, uh, I think uh, the without this kind of summit, in, uh, we have two times in Washington and Seoul. Uh, without summit, uh, I don't think we could achieve uh, this kind of, you know, uh, deliverable. Uh, like, uh, you know, many countries uh, ratified uh, two uh, conventions and minimized and uh, removed those uh, HEU. Uh, uh, so I think uh, uh, this is a merit of summit uh, to uh, get a lot of uh, deliverable and national commitment uh, by the participation of heads of state. Uh, this is one fact. And second fact is, mm, at, as we uh, started this process with the participation of you know 53 countries uh, and uh, you know four international organizations. Uh, this is our now became, you know, uh, uh, I think a joint ownership on a nuclear security summit. So uh, decision on whether we will continue or not uh, should be uh, done by the uh, discussion of the participating countries, you know, as, as a consensus uh, based on what I said, uh, what, what could be our long-term vision and what could be our long-term goal on nuclear security. So uh, I think uh, it's, it's up to the whole participating members uh, based on uh, our discussion from now on uh, toward uh, 2014 in Netherlands. And I would add that Sherpas uh, have been significantly less bold than their leaders. So we might want to see if we can find a way to get leader opinions on this rather than Sherpa, Sherpa opinions. Um, because it's ultimately the only thing worse than not having a summit is having a summit and having only half the leaders show up. Um, you certainly don't want some, any data point out there that suggests that leaders don't care about the issue. So I think it's important to, the, the, uh, you have to know people will continue to come uh, mm -hmm. if the summit process will continue. Let me um, open the floor for questions and a reminder to um, wait for the microphone and speak into it because we have our friends watching us on uh, the, the webcast and want to make sure they can hear your questions. Uh, Duyan, I saw you first and then so, here. Um, Duyan, could you stand up so the person with the mic will see you? Thank you. Hi. Deanne Kim, Center for Arms Control and Nonproliferation. I want to bank off of what uh, Laura just mentioned uh, about getting leaders there to the summit. Um, even for this summit, that was another. That was a big question. Uh, will certain heads of state actually show up in Seoul? And even uh, certain government officials in certain countries even raise the question: Why should my leader go uh, to Seoul if we're only going to focus narrowly on security? And there are some countries that. Uh, felt, well, if the scope is going to be expanded a little bit to include safety in light of Fukushima, then there's a reason for my leader to go. And so uh, looking ahead, uh, and, and the question of it, if the summit process is to continue at the summit level, and let's say perhaps before it's um, transitioned into a new mechanism, whether it's absorbed by the IAEA or whatnot, uh, is there possibility and potential for perhaps the scope to be even expanded a tad more to attract uh, attentions to 2014. Uh, I know that there are already discussions uh, among participating states on the need and the desire and the want to perhaps see 
some sort of discussion on other issues, whether it's disarmament, whether it's non-proliferation or safeguards or whatnot. So um, is there that type of possibility to perhaps introduce even a smaller, a new element so that you can uh, sustain and maintain a summit level participation? Well, I really want to disagree with your premise um, because the uh, what we found in the process of negotiating the communique was that there was strong, strong support for a maintenance of a focus on security. Um, in fact, uh, as Chung He knows, the the draft, the text uh, in the drafts shrunk and shrunk and shrunk in the course of the conversation. Um, and then even in the uh, section of the discussion that was intended uh, during the summit, there was a lunchtime discussion that was aimed to focus on the safety security interface to kind of contain uh, that issue and keep the focus elsewhere. Um, even in that discussion, very people actually brought up the safety issue. So I want to suggest that the safety issue was a problem for the outside community. There was never a question inside the summit process uh, about what role safety should play. The, it was only a question of is it 5% or 10% of our space. And I, in the discussions that the United States had anyway, I, don't, I can't speak for what discussions the Koreans had, um, it was never raised uh, that, oh, my, my leader would only be interested if safety were on the agenda. Um, the, the, the reason leaders didn't come had to do with electoral politics, with personal health, um, you know, with uh, perhaps somebody else in the cabinet being really interested in participating in the issue. I, that none of the reasons that were given to us, even in, in quiet, uh, you know, in private, uh, had anything to do with the scope of the conversation. Uh, that being said, I think broadening the scope is a disaster. Um, that's the whole reason the summit has been a success. That's what leader after leader after leader said in the summit process. Um, we have numerous other places to, to argue about disarmament, to discuss non-proliferation issues. In fact, the non-pro, the NPT Rev, uh, PrepCom is starting up uh, just this week. Um, it's not uh, um, obvious, uh, in fact, it's obvious to the contrary, that bringing those issues into the conversation will only limit our ability to make progress. If I mm -hmm. add, uh, I think that's true uh, that in Seoul summit, uh, more than I think 14, 15 heads of state spoke on uh, disarmament issue, you know, the, the world without nuclear weapons. Uh, so, and also additional uh, five or six countries mentioned on uh, CTBT and another five, six countries mentioned on the uh, fissile material cut-up treaty. Uh, so uh, that's true that uh, I think uh, NSS uh, will, you know, uh, encourage uh, the discussion of on, on other nuclear-related issue. Uh, we can say that this is a pos positive uh, effect of a nuclear security summit to encourage you know, discussion on, on other nuclear-related issues. Uh, but uh, I think uh, we now we have dilemma, you know, uh, to expand the scope of discussion, you know, including other nuclear-related issue. Uh, looks like uh, you know, uh, you know, appropriate and desirable, you know, for the participation of uh, heads of state. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we have different, uh, you know, limitation. As uh, Laura said, that uh, you know, other sensitive issue, disarmament and and non-proliferation. Uh, has their own, uh, you know, forum to discuss. And if we put uh, those, uh, you know, different agenda in the summit, I don't think we can, uh, you know, forge uh, the membership of, of 58 mm -hmm. countries, you know, to discuss uh, on this issue because uh, on that specific sensitive issues, you know, we c it's difficult to achieve some uh, substantial and specific uh, agreement. So uh, I think uh, this is dilemma we have. Uh, so. Uh, in reality, it's not easy to put the uh, you know different issues uh, in the in the summit to achieve something. I think uh, if because of you know with the limited uh, scope on nuclear security, we could uh, have achieved this kind of uh, very uh, tangible delivery. Miles Pompa, what's next? Please stand up so the person with the microphone knows who I'm pointing at. Oh, thank you. Coming from the other side. Thanks to both of you. Uh, I have a few questions. Um, I appreciate your, uh, Laura, your talk about the nuclear cooperation agreements and that how that might be used for, for standards and peer review. I'm wondering, um, as far as I know, I mean, there's general NSG rules that call for physical protection standards, but they haven't been specified 
in terms of clearly requiring IMSERC 225 Rev 5, for instance. Um, and there's no, a lot of countries, as far as I know, other than the United States, don't have some kind of peer review process. Uh, I'd be interested in what Korea is thinking about this issue going forward as it becomes a significant uh, nuclear exporter. Um, I'd also be um, interested in the medical isotopes issue. You, um, congratulations on some of those agreements. Um, and I know the language in the communique and so on talked about incentives to encourage people to purchase LEU-based isotopes. Um, what do you see as, I mean, as the summit process itself, and I know the U.S. government has its own discussions on this issue going forward in terms of what, it, what might actually happen on incentives that would encourage c countries to purchase what might likely be more expensive LEU-based isotopes? Start uh, regarding peer review. Uh, I can think about. Uh, I think uh, as uh, Miles said, uh, you know, uh, we have a uh, uh, specific. Uh, I think a mechanism. Uh, first of all, uh, the importance of uh, 2005 uh, amended uh, CPPNM. Uh, so we, we put target date on 2014 entry into force. I think the reason why we emphasize the importance of this uh, convention is that this is related to uh, the, you know, um, the, the physical protection of nuclear facility. Uh, this is all the more important after Fukushima uh, accident. And, and uh, you know, pending uh, entry into force of this uh, CPPNM, uh, we also have to emphasize the importance of uh, IMSERC uh, uh, 225, uh, Revision 5, uh, to be implemented uh, to the you know, domestic uh, you know, uh, regulation and practices. Uh, and, and of course, this is very important. And we, we think that also uh, all uh, recommendations and uh, guidance published by the IAEA on nuclear security uh, also important you know so we encourage uh, as many as possible uh, you know those recommendations and, and guidance uh, should be reflected for the domestic practices and uh, another I think important uh, criteria to be used as a peer review mechanism at this moment is uh, IPAS service uh, International Physical Protection Advisory Service IPPAS, uh, IPAS service is a uh, very important, uh, you know, uh, designated service by the IAEA to uh, be applied to the every uh, member countries to check, you know, their level of, uh, you know, physical protection. So uh, whether some countries uh, get got this or not could be, uh, I think, another important peer review uh, mechanism criteria. Uh, and also, I uh, think the, the national progress report, as I said, uh, for two years from, uh, I think, in Seoul summit and I think uh, next summit in Netherlands, uh, almost all countries will present their national progress report. I think this could be uh, another way to check, uh, you know, uh, I think, pure review mechanism for the time being. Or did you want to mention anything about the NSG as a mechanism and then also uh, the medical isotope issue? Well, certainly we're looking at um, this upcoming meeting of the NSG uh, to talk about the role of the NSG in um, helping countries live up to the commitments made um, in the communique and in other, uh, other documents, whether it's treaties or us, uh, otherwise. Um, on the incentives, we're building a package uh, that we hope to be able to announce at the, next, at the upcoming OECD experts meeting on um, uh, the conversion uh, issues and the medical isotope issues this summer, so watch this space. Okay. I'm getting to be very good friends with my uh, Veterans Administration colleagues. Interesting. Uh, Tom Cochran. Uh, I'm Tom Cochran from NRDC. Uh, I'd like to get some your feedback on my assessment. I think the U.S. and its uh, Nuclear Security Summit partners should be commended for reducing the number of sites and even countries where highly enriched uranium is is uh, used uh, for civil purposes. 
But I think they should be admonished for ignoring the elephants in the room. And by that I mean the highest risk, and the title you use is nuclear summit, but your objective is to reduce the risk. And the highest risk comes from the big bulk handling facilities that fabricate and pro process and fabricate nuclear fuel. I don't, s and, and we know where the highest risk facilities are. We don't think they're in the United States. But I don't see how you eliminate or reduce the risk at those facilities significantly without addressing the U.S. use of highly enriched uranium for civil and naval propulsion purposes. And our big facilities in the U.S., NSF Irwin and Lynchburg, the BMW Lynchburg facility, the capacity of HEU flowing through those facilities will not be diminished until you address the naval propulsion issue in the U.S. and the big reactor users, which are all, the main ones are government, and the U.S. government places a higher priority on maintaining neutron flux in those reactors than it does on the elimination of the risks associated with civil use of HEU. I'd like your comments on my comments. You won't be surprised to know that I disagree uh, with some of it. Uh, certainly, bulk handling facilities are the, the riskiest. Um, I think it's also uh, not reasonable to expect that a summit uh, will be the place that that issue is addressed. I commend to you President Obama's comments at the Hankook University the day before the summit, uh, which we consider prog two in terms of laying out uh, an aggressive uh, vision of, of nuclear future, and, and uh, he speaks there of the dangers of of uh, certain uh, approaches to fuel cycles and highlights accumulations of, of, of stocks and bulk handling facilities as, as particularly concerning in that regard. Um, as for the U.S. facilities, we've made enormous strides since, 19, since the 70s in reducing the use of HEU in civil uh, facilities. Uh, I challenge anyone else on the planet to meet our record uh, in that regard. Um, the, there are a small handful of facilities, as you note, uh, at least a couple of them on uh, U.S. government uh, secure reservations uh, that continue to use material. Yes, because their missions require the high flux. Uh, we've committed to convert as soon as those react, as soon as the spent fuel or the new, I'm sorry, the new fuel is licensed and available for use. Um, again, I challenge anyone to match that record of performance. Uh, finally, on naval propulsion, um, I can't think of a single case where my discussions with another country about their civil use of plutonium uh, has even raised the issue of, well, we'll, we'll convert our, power, our little research reactor when you uh, get the Navy on board with LEU propulsion. It's just not part of the conversation, uh, and I think uh, it's not, uh, it, it has no, no constraint, uh, whatever the merits of that case are, internally to itself, and that's a conversation to be had in a, in a different room with different people. Um, but the, uh, the, the position of the U.S. government on that issue is not in any way constraining our ability to make progress with others on reducing civil use of, of uh, highly enriched uranium. Yeah, if I add, uh, our general approach on uh, you know, HU minimization, we have a very uh, strong uh, objective of HU minimization. On the minimization, there are two you know, areas. One is uh, just the removal of existing HEU on uh, particularly in civilian purpose. Uh, at the same time, we have a conversion uh, issue. So I think conversion is very important, as I said, uh, more than 99 and high, den uh, high density LU uh, fuel powder product uh, issues to uh, make you know, uh, civilian HEU unnecessary. So uh, those unneeded material should could be uh, you know returned to the original countries uh, without any reservation or hesitation. So I think this is the way uh, you know we handle it to uh, make uh, all uh, civilian HU unnecessary you know with the conversion uh, process. So uh, and after that, uh, if you eliminate all unnecessary civilian you know HU 
I think uh, you know we can uh, think about you know what could be next uh, target uh, area. So uh, in that sense, I think this very incremental way or uh, ratchet up uh, way, you know, to uh, go uh, to the you know next level uh, to the you know including as I said even P5 countries. Uh, so I think uh, uh, we have to make a step by step uh, approach. Thank you, Chungi. I had um, DP next on my list. Hi, Deep D. Chobe with the Nuclear Threat Initiative. I really liked this um, question, Corey, you asked about missed stories. And I've been a little concerned also about how the media and the broader commentariat has talked about the last two summits, and particularly this last one. And I feel like they missed a storyline around leadership, where I think that this threat is seen as one that developed countries care about, yet we see examples from countries like Indonesia, Algeria, Jordan, who are taking on important um, baskets of issues. So one, I was wondering if you can kind of comment more about how you see this globalizing of leadership around this issue, kind of what other examples would you throw out there? And then the flip side of that is, I think summit commitments are a really imperfect prism through which to define someone's engagement or leadership on an issue. I think we all know that there's a range of political or security issues that either inhibit or create space for governments to really interact on this. But I was hoping that both of you could provide a little bit more color from your engagement, both for the 2010 summit and 2012, with countries that we usually think of as being maybe a little defensive on this issue. And I think we know kind of like who those handful of countries are. Um, just what were those engagements like? You know, were they always quiet? Were they instead offering leadership in other ways? Were they instead engaged in kind of the diplomatic battle in terms of language? Just give some sense to kind of how you would further characterize those countries. Do you want to start or Laura? Well, I'm thinking about um, countries that are kind of uh, punching above their weight, if you will in nuclear security space. You mentioned some three very important ones. Um, and uh, I really want to shine a spotlight on, uh, on Jordan here. Um, their Sherpa is uh, Prince Zed, who it had been their ambassador here and now is their perm rep in New York. And when I mentioned earlier that there were sometimes voices that reminded us of, this, of the seriousness of the issue with which we were engaged and the need to be bold and aggressive, he was one of those constant voices in our Sherpa conversation that brought us back to the reality of what we're talking about. And this is not about commas, this is not about caveats, this is not about diplobabble, this is about real life threats that our countries and our peoples face and our responsibility as government officials to deal with that uh, and reduce that. Um, the, and, and the Indonesians are just so, um, that, you know, I think they're fresh from their own CTBT ratification effort and they're trying to really take the momentum and the skills and the personal knowledge that they developed in that ratification process and apply it to this nuclear security agenda. I mean, it's the same individual, in fact, who was personally responsible for getting the CTBT ratification completed inside Indonesia, who has, who has gotten religion on, on this notion of the implementation uh, kits and how do you go from, you know, signing on the bottom line to actually living it uh, in your country. Um, I want to also highlight Morocco. Uh, if you look at their national statement, it just goes on and on about all the things that they've done in their country to enhance nuclear security. They've been very active in the global initiative to combat nuclear terrorism and really taken a leadership role there uh, as well. And they highlight that throughout their report. Uh, the Lithuanians are another uh, interesting example. And uh, there they were. Uh, uh, fairly constant visitors to my office. I, I know they were in frequent contact with Korea in terms of advocating for being included in the summit. And um, they recognized that um, they needed to be, you know, to have something to show for that participation. And so they're setting up uh, their own uh, counter nuclear smuggling center of excellence. Um, and they'll be opening the doors on that this summer. Um, they've taken a number of other steps internally uh, relating to nuclear security that they spoke of in their national statement. Um, so I think it's a really interesting um, way for countries to shine on the global stage without having material, <laughs> without having a problem uh, of that character, without necessarily even having a lot of money um, or resources from an assistance concept. They can lead by example and uh, lead by moral suasion. Um, 
And finally, I just in terms of the color, I would just add uh, how, um, you know, kind of surprisingly enthusiastic our Pakistani uh, Sherpa has been about the summit process. Um, I mean, he engaged with the, you know, with the best of the diplomats about, you know, commas and caveats and redrafting text and all of those things. But in the midst of that, he, there was this constant refrain of this process is, is beneficial for Pakistan. It's beneficial for Pakistan to participate in this process. Um, and the uh, kind of new techniques of diplomatic engagement or even non-diplomatic engagement, I would say, um, how much he appreciated the innovations that the summit process in 2010 and then again in 2012 uh, brought to uh, this issue as compared with other perhaps more structured formats. Uh, so it was interesting, just some nobody, don't, don't anybody be insulted by being excluded in those lists. We had lots of lots of good players. Can you? Yeah. Uh, you know, composition of a uh, nuclear security summit, participating countries, uh, are very, uh, you know, comprehensive and, and unique. Uh, you know, we have uh, five, uh, uh, you know, recognized uh, nuclear weapon state and uh, you know, non-nuclear weapon state and also, you know, uh, non mpt uh, three uh, countries like uh, Israel, uh, India, and Pakistan. And also, I think more than uh, 25 uh, countries from uh, non-alignment -ali movement. So, uh, and also, you know, developing countries and uh, advanced country. So I think a very uh, unique composition of uh, participating countries. And also nuclear, even though nuclear security uh, is you know, prevention of nuclear terrorism. I think uh, our goal is quite clear and uh, we are going the same direction. Uh, even though uh, we are in the same boat, I think, uh, but because of the nature of nuclear issue is always sensitive. So it's difficult to, uh, you know, ask all participating countries, you know, to go one direction with some specific, you know, uh, objective. Uh, in, in that sense, uh, I think uh, in, in Washington summit, the uh, U.S. made a very uh, strong leadership role uh, to make a first, uh, uh, you know, important criteria and uh, as as a, as a objective. But uh, I think Korea, in a different uh, context, uh, made a very uh, I think uh, interesting uh, contribution uh, because uh, we are not uh, you know nuclear weapon state. But on the, at the same time, uh, we have very uh, strong uh, nuclear capability with the fifth uh, largest uh, nuclear power plant uh, with uh, 21 uh, reactors uh, in, in South Korea. Um, so I think uh, we could manage. Uh, at, the sa at, the, at the beginning, I think uh, many countries are trying to make a very simple, uh, you know, uh, uh, some political will, you know, type of uh, statement uh, like a Seoul communique. But I think uh, we try to, uh, you know, persuade them to, uh, with the participation of uh, 58 heads of state, I think we have to show to the international uh, uh, community that uh, we are working really hard and, you know, with some tangible result. Uh, and without that, it's just, you know, uh, a gathering of, uh, you know, uh, heads of state without any uh, specific, uh, you know, uh, action. So uh, in that sense, I think uh, we, Korea, uh, a very unique position, you know, to uh, converge uh, with, uh, as I said, some maximum <laughs> common denominator. And uh, uh, some countries also has some, uh, you know, defensive on uh, specific, you know, target date, as I said. And also even the, the concept of gift basket, uh, they said that, you know, uh, in Seoul Summit, uh, official document is the only uh, Seoul communique. You know, if there is any other document to be agreed and adopted uh, without any, you know, uh, negotiation on specific language, then uh, it's difficult to accept. But uh, we tell them, you know, this is really a voluntary exercise by the like-minded countries. The virtue of this gift basket is uh, we don't have to negotiate the language. I think one uh, leading country can issue a uh, draft joint statement whether some countries are willing to join. Uh, so it's very simple. Uh, if uh, some countries 
have a reservation on some specific language, you know, they can they cannot do that just uh, simply. And so I think uh, this is a uh, 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 really uh, you know persuasive point that this is voluntary exercise. So if uh, any countries uh, has a that position to do so, they can join. Otherwise, they can you know stay uh, outside. So. Uh, 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 in that sense, I think Kip the Basket is very uh, important achievement in our journey. Thank you. Jennifer McBee and then Melissa was next. Thank you. Well, congratulations on your achievement. And um, I was just wondering, I, I know that it's for obvious reasons this is not treaty-based, but because it's not, you have no real national implementation measures which govern the citizens of each country. And I wondered if there's an effort to keep track of that. Laura mentioned something about the Nuclear Regulatory Commission doing things, and I wonder if there are similar efforts in other countries governing the citizens, putting restrictions on citizens under their jurisdiction. I'm not sure I grasped the question, but I can say that uh, in reviewing the national um, progress reports, almost every country re reported having uh, upgraded its nuclear security regulations, its national regulations since 2010 even, and just in the last two years, the U.S. Uh, was one of those. Um, and several other countries are, several countries are um, changing the status of their nuclear regulator, and Korea is one of those, <laughs> uh, uh, Japan, Kazakhstan, uh, India is talking about it, a um, couple of other countries, to make their regulator more independent, uh, which is one of the independent from the promotional uh, sides of their, of their uh, government. And uh, that was something that's called for in the work plan uh, of the uh, 2010 summit. Um, so I think there's a lot of regulatory movement on the nuclear security issue. The uh, um, completion of the guidelines contained in uh, IMSERC 225 Rev 5 gives another impetus to, uh, you know, the desire for, for countries to update uh, their national regulations. In the summit, uh, many uh, countries mentioned that uh, this nuclear security is, is one of the top their national agenda. So I think uh, this uh, sense of, you know, urgency or, you know, perception will definitely contribute to the, uh, you know, putting a lot of their IAEA guideline or, or two conventions or, you know, Rev 5 uh, to, to the, their domestic uh, regulation and practices. Uh, so uh, I think uh, as, as uh, many different ways, as the Korean case, that we established, you know, independent uh, uh, nuclear security uh, safety uh, commission uh, so uh, to reinforce uh, our regulatory body uh, and uh, say, uh, some countries could adopt you know many different elements in uh, particularly you know two two conventions the CPPNM and also exact uh, nuclear terrorism convention to the domestic uh, regulation the importance of those conventions, uh, there are many uh, penalty clause. So uh, to have very strong and robust uh, domestic regulatory uh, you know, mechanism, uh, those uh, penalty clauses should be implemented uh, and embodied to the uh, domestic regulation. I think uh, so. this is another task we have to achieve. I just want to take a moment because Chung Hee's talked a lot about the treaties. I don't want my silence on the treaties to communicate anything other than a desperate enthusiasm to get the laws passed by Congress so we can ratify in the U.S. I have weekly phone calls with colleagues at Department of State and, Co and Department of Justice who are working with uh, friends on Capitol Hill. I understand we may have uh, passed one uh, further hurdle uh, in kind of the interminable uh, legislative process. Uh, last week uh, and that uh, there's at least a possibility that this might be done within the next month. Um, the encouraging thing is that this is not at all a bipartisan or a partisan issue. We have bipartisan support for it in both the House and the Senate. It's just a matter of getting the language out, up, done, and over, <laughs> and, and then having it come to the White House so we can do our piece on the executive branch. So um, I'm, I'm hopeful and uh, focused on that one. Thank you, Laura. And I'm envious that uh, Korea was able to get their ratifications done before we were. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I'm Melissa Mann with Urenco, and I'd appreciate the government perspective on what I'll call the Shadow Summit, and that was the gathering of industry that we've had in both 2010 and again in 2012. Uh, what do you see as the value in that process, maybe the points of intersection between the formal government summit and the industry action, and any advice or challenges you want to lay down to the industry as we look toward 2014? Um, before an answer, I'd like to thank Melissa for um, asking the question that I clearly planted with you, um, because it was on one of my cards and I, and I didn't get to it. But um, So I'd like to expand on, in addition to the industry, the expert community, um, I think one of the benefits was that, as opposed to how it was done in 2010, South Korea and in their leadership really, you know, embraced these parallel communities and saw these at these uh, the nuclear industry summit, the nuclear security symposium, or the so-called expert summit, as really being part of their summit leadership and part of the summit process. Um, unfortunately, it was done in a way that there really couldn't be much overlap or interaction among the communities because all the events were going on at the same time. So um, I'd like you to address, m most importantly, address Melissa's question since she asked it, but also if you have any thoughts on going forward, how we can make sure that, there, that we can bring these communities together because as uh, I think it's the only way to really um, have some sustainability and, impl and true implementation of the kinds of commitments made at the official level at the summit is to have all three of these communities engaged. So. Let me leave uh, you with that. Yes, uh, in Seoul Summit, we had the uh, industry summit as well as expert symposium. Um, in, in the Seoul communique, we put, uh, I think, almost uh, four or five different mm -hmm. uh, areas on the importance of engagement of private sector, you know, NGO, industry, and academia uh, as a, you know, uh, as the same uh, responsible stakeholders on nuclear security uh, because without input from the uh, private sector as well as uh, support from the uh, uh, NGO and, pri and, and private sectors, it's difficult to achieve uh, what we have to achieve. So uh, in that sense, in Seoul Summit, particularly uh, industry summit uh, was very timely because uh, there is a you know a Fukushima accident, so operator should consider uh, those two issues together: nuclear security and nuclear safety, to have a, a very uh, strong uh, uh, you know uh, facility safety and security uh, regime. So uh, this is very important uh, achievement and and input from the private sector. And they issued a joint statement, and they established uh, three different working groups uh, in industry summit. Uh, I think uh, this practice uh, should and can continue uh, from now on t uh, toward the uh, 2014 Netherlands summit. I think uh, you know Korean team is ready to support uh, that process, uh, and also expert symposium is also important because uh, expert can uh, think about uh, what could be long-term vision and long-term uh, global nuclear security architecture. So those input uh, are very important to, uh, for the government to consider, you know, what could be best, uh, uh, you know, appropriate in, in future of the nuclear security. Um, I'll just echo what, what Chung Hee said about the critical involvement of both the civil society and the industry communities in achieving nuclear security outcomes. Um, particularly when we remind ourselves that over half the fissile material on the planet is in the hands of the private sector. Um, the, um, I, and I'm simply share my disappointment that the, all the meetings were lined up on the same day that we had our final Sherpa meeting, the industry event, the, the uh, expert event, and I couldn't attend any of them. <laughs> I mean, uh, either of those two uh, because of the requirements uh, the, that we had on the, on the official side. So I confess I have no perception <laughs> of the industry event because I've had no visibility into it and hopefully we can do that differently next time as well. Kenny Fletcher with Exchange Monitor Publications. Um, following the summit there were some comments from non-governmental organizations I guess calling for more comprehensive enforceable agreements. Um, and I was hoping to get your reaction to that, if that was a fair criticism um, from those groups. 
well, if that was an expectation of those groups, they certainly had no basis for that to be an expectation. It's never been a, a goal of the summits to create that. There's no evidence in the 2010 document that that's where the summit was headed, and certainly nobody was arguing inside the Sherpa room uh, for such a such a, an event. I think we discussed at some length earlier how one can move from the current level of understanding uh, to norm setting to soft law to hard law. But uh, the notion of, of spending time now to actually negotiate new treaties when we can't even get universalization of the existing treaties. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'd rather spend time with the doers than the ditherers. Um, and uh, what the summit has done so far is empower the doers. And I think that's where we really need to keep our focus. I Rick keep it with the formally with the 1540 committee as of last month. So, um, I, a quick question: One of our, I think, real challenges as uh, as the 1540 committee emerged as really an institution was finding its place among all the other institutions. And you both mentioned that. Um, and as it seems like there'll be either the, the summit will be extended or there'll be some replacement mechanism, it is looking like it will be more of a long-term uh, institutional presence in the, in the international community. So uh, I'm wondering if you could comment a little bit more about uh, how you see building in relationships with the various in international institutions that exist now, uh, not just the IAEA though, but also the regional institutions um, and some of the emerging ones that I know Africa has a new international regulatory agency uh, institution looking at security, for example, uh, but also 1540 committee, uh, you mentioned it a bit. Uh, I will note, I don't believe we received an invitation uh, as to the committee itself uh, to, to participate. That's just an example of, oh, of your, how your to figure boss, that out. Your boss was there. Yeah, I know he, I know he was. I know he was. And, and it's and up to him boss, to pick his Sherpa. And, and, mm -hmm. our, and our boss before was also uh, the Sherpa for uh, yes. uh, Costa Rica, so, I mean, Mexico, excuse me. So, um, so we have had a presence, but finding, you know, how do you, how do you go about, how do you see the summit now if you're looking at it in the long term, fitting in with all the other arrangements, and what are you going to do? Again, especially the regional ones, I'm, I'm you know, interested in hearing a little bit more on that. So thanks. Well, I'll take a stab at that, and I know Chung He's done some thinking as well. Um, on the regional point, um, I, I hope that we will uh, continue with the, the effort that has been made to create regional briefings uh, for the Nuclear Security Summit that involve both uh, summit countries and non-summit countries. And if those want to be kind of structured around an existing 1540 structure, I would welcome that. Um, the um, Certainly, the UN was represented uh, and, you know, very powerfully. Uh, I don't think it's re realistic to expect that 1540 gets its own seat uh, when uh, countries uh, have uh, single, uh, you know, single leaders. But um, the certainly it would have been great to have had more more presence of the 1540 community committee in the Sherpa, Sue Sherpa Yak uh, process, and uh, maybe uh, the uh, Angela Kane will think about uh, that in a slightly different way this time around. Um, one of the things, that, and, and to your point on, on coordination, um, that, that has been put into the agency, uh, the IAEA specifically, to play that linkage role with the whole range of other insti insti institutions. Um, so it's the, the summit made, made clear the point that we need to do a better job across those connectivities uh, with the global initiative, with the uh, global partnership. And I really want to applaud the, the efforts of my colleague, Ambassador Jenkins, who was one of the baby yaks uh, for the summit, um, in bringing that ethic into the global partnership of pulling together all of the international organizations that play on that agenda, as well as the, the members, member states. Um, one of the things that I see the 1540 committee is, as being able to do uniquely because of the, the binding global character of the resolution's requirements is to create that demand pull for assistance by helping educate countries with what they're expected to do and helping them decide and determine whether or not they can actually do that on their own. And to the degree they can't, if they need help, then to bring that in a more structured, formal, and broadly accessible way beyond the current matrix concept that exists so that that can be, can be connected with multilateral, uh, informal, uh, minilateral, if you will, and bilateral sources of assistance um, that already exist uh, to support those efforts. So I'm, I really kind of see the, the 
the 1540 uh, committee as, as being a bunch of Johnny Appleseeds in, uh, in waiting <laughs> uh, to help uh, promulgate and, uh, and attract uh, the, the, those who feel that they need help um, to, to do the job that they need to do, or just to be conscious enough to, to do it on their own if they don't need help. Uh, I think a 1540 uh, committee is very important uh, in that this is one of the uh, few uh, legally binding uh, mechanism and uh, initiative uh, related to nuclear security. Even though uh, 1540 is not, you know, focusing uh, solely on uh, nuclear security, you know, it's more or less uh, WMD uh, and uh, non-state actors. So uh, I think the role of 1540 is uh, important. Uh, but I think we have to give more uh, political impetus uh, to 1540 uh, on uh, you know nuclear security, and and also you know coordinating issue is very important among you know uh, we have we we call almost uh, you know five uh, nuclear security related uh, mechanism or initiative like uh, uh, two conventions and 1540 and GICNP and uh, G8 uh, Global Partnership. Uh, uh, but we put the, you know, this uh, coordination uh, responsibility to, to the uh, IAEA uh, as, as much as possible. Uh, and then IAEA uh, has a plan to have coordination meeting in next year, uh, June 2013. Uh, I think uh, you know, this is first uh, coordination meeting uh, um, you know, by IAEA. So I think uh, we have to put uh, a lot of uh, emphasis on this coordination meeting so that, you know, those uh, uh, mechanisms and initiatives could uh, uh, perform effectively. And the regional thing, uh, I think, is very important in that, uh, you know, regional context, you know, they can do, uh, like, a uh, very important issue, like, uh, you know, counter smuggling issue and export control issue and also, uh, you know, uh, financial issue too. So uh, I, I just visited, uh, you know, mm, recently uh, Kuala Lumpur. There is a Southeast Asia country's uh, regional uh, uh, discussion on uh, nuclear security uh, and also all nuclear challenges. I think those area is very uh, homogeneous. I think a very uh, good example for the regional uh, cooperation. Uh, and also another good example is, uh, you know, Northeast Asia, like China, Korea, Japan. Those c three countries uh, have, uh, you know, many uh, uh, nuclear reactors than any other area in the world. I think it's very uh, condensed area for nuclear reactors and also, you know, regional uh, uh, geographical uh, proximit uh, proximity, I think. Uh, uh, we, Korea, will try to initiate, uh, you know, this kind of uh, regional cooperation among China, Japan, and Korea on nuclear security, as well as uh, uh, nuclear safety. And on top of that, I think there is a couple of uh, or two or three different issues, uh, you know, uh, to uh, consider in the future uh, how to reinforce the nuclear security objective. I think one is uh, like a PSI. Uh, this is the emerging, you know, uh, uh, mechanism or regime, uh, and also the other one is, uh, you know, uh, you know, financial control. Uh, you know, whether uh, uh, we can tighten uh, the, the activities of non-state actors based on 1540, uh, but in the nuclear security area, uh, we we can think about, you know, those two issues, but. Uh, I think is a uh, very sensitive issue. So I think, uh, as I said, uh, we have to discuss a uh, very uh, incremental way on, on those issues. Thank you. Um, I didn't have anybody else uh, indicate they wanted to ask a question, so I'll wrap us up here. Um, I would note that given that President Obama's Prague speech um, also mentioned um, financial controls, PSI, global initiative, I find it uh, interesting and heartening that it's our South Korean colleague that brought them up from the podium rather than our administration colleague. But um, um, let me just say, uh, first of all, thank you both for participating in this more unusual conversational format. Um, I hope people found it interesting. Um, but uh, knowing that you didn't have prepared remarks, let me close by giving you each an opportunity to 
ask yourself and then answer the question you wish, wish you got. Um, and maybe also uh, close by sharing um, an anecdote or something that will give us a flavor of, of the process from a personal point of view um, uh, as we kind of close this round of, uh, of assessment of the last two years and look forward to, uh, to the Netherlands in 2014. Uh, Laura, maybe you first and then Chung Hee. Well, uh, the questions have all been great, so I'm not sure I have anything I've managed to You're weasel, not obligated. weasel my comments so that I wanted to be sure to make into the framework of the questions that were posed. Um, you've done a great job in playing Oprah here, <laughs> and uh, there's a little vial of uranium under each of your seats. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, just a, anecdotally, um, I will just, just mention the um, the real personal engagement of President Obama in this issue. Um, I was his keeper for the meals um, and ended up in a fair amount of kind of hold time moments when it's, you know, just kind of a very small handful of us with the president just kind of waiting for the right time for him to enter a room and so on. And, and in those conversations, it's clear how much he personally has, has, uh, has this commitment. I mean, this really does come from the heart for him. Um, he made a couple wistful comments about people he wished could have been there with us um, because of their long-term commitment uh, to the issue. Um, he, and then at the very end of the summit, um, as President Lee was, was uh, making his closing remarks, President Obama kind of spontaneously grabbed the microphone and expressed his views of why the summit mattered. Uh, why it was relevant for leaders to come together in the midst of everything that they have to do, uh, recognizing the empowerment that that leadership uh, presence gives to all of us, Sherpas, Sue Sherpas, Yaks, and uh, the whole infrastructure that makes nuclear security reality happen. Um, and also noticing, uh, making, uh, identifying the incremental nature of, of success. That, that's just the way it is in this field. You don't have giant thunderclaps and then the world is different. It's something, it, it's, it's a building upon itself process, um, which from my point of view is kind of fun because it means, you know, every day there's almost something, something that's been done or something you can do or the world is different in a relevant way. Um, but I, I just, we, we, thanks to uh, the speedy work of Chung Hee and his colleagues, we were able to get the text of that spontaneous utterance from the president at the end of the summit, and we put it on the White House website. So I just commend to you, it's just a page and a half long, um, but uh, I think is, is just real evidence of the kind of personal engagement that uh, launched this process, that has sustained it in terms of the U.S. government commitment. And I really, in that case, also want to highlight the immense respect and gratitude I have towards my U.S. government colleagues who work tirelessly without even being baby yaks uh, or uh, getting to go to Seoul uh, to make the kind of differences, many of which were uh, we came to fruition in Seoul in March. Uh, and it's a, it's a, as taxpayers, you're really getting your money's worth from your U.S. government on this issue. Thank you. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, one, one issue we didn't uh, discuss uh, too much is regarding uh, interface between nuclear safety and nuclear security. Uh, this uh, agenda has been forwarded by the you know Korean government, considering uh, the public concern on uh, nuclear uh, power plant after Fukushima accident. Uh, but uh, it it turned out to be I think uh, one of the most important achievement uh, in Seoul summit. Uh, uh, you know, because the now uh, many countries are trying to uh, construct a, you know new nuclear power plant uh, in next uh, you know several years and decades. So I think this is fact that we have to manage uh, safety and security of the nuclear facilities. Uh, but in Seoul summit, I think this is the first important occasion then uh, that we have to tackle those two issues together based on uh, rigorous uh, technical uh, and aspect uh, as well as a uh, policy aspect. So uh, in, in the future, I think uh, in, in the framework of IAEA, we have to discuss more on the interrelationship between those two issues and how to make uh, you know, all nuclear facility uh, safe and secure. Uh, so I think there is many technical aspect. Uh, so I think uh, this is ongoing issue. Uh, I think uh, uh, we, are, we are right, you know, to choose uh, this 
particular you know agenda in in Seoul summit and uh, finally uh, I'm very happy to be engaged in this uh, you know really uh, important exercise during uh, last uh, uh, one or two years uh, so this is really you know uh, once in a lifetime <laughs> uh, work uh, for Korean diplomat I'm very happy to uh, be involved in this work and also I'm uh, taking this opportunity I have to, uh, want to express my thanks to Laura uh, without you know her support you know I I, I could uh, not achieve this uh, you know uh, uh, good uh, result in Seoul summit and also all uh, U.S. Uh, you know experts uh, like Corey and and Alex and you know Miles and and Duyan and so thank you for your always uh, you know uh, very stimulating and provoking you know attitude uh, uh, toward uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the leadership of uh, you know Korean government. Well, before I turn it over to Richard to to close us out, I would just like to say that I, I think that the. The nuclear security summit process has really benefited from both your participation um, as individuals and leadership. And um, I'm not making a political statement, but rather a personal one when I say that I hope you're both in involved uh, between now and, and 2014. Um, uh, I, and Laura, I would note that you know we could actually have a giant thunderclap, that and the world would be different. And that's what we're trying to avoid. So I, I'm looking forward to. Uh, seeing the progress made over the next two years. And Richard, I think, oh, here it's okay. <laughs> um, but maybe before he says anything, let's thank our speakers. <laughs> okay. I also wanted to thank Connect US Fund for supporting this effort. And I particularly wanted to thank Perry and Jamie in the back there who've been organizing all the AV and the photos and everything else. I couldn't do it without them. And please join me in thanking my interns, Joseph and Lisa. But wasn't there are future generation, and hopefully we'll contribute this agenda as we go forth. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.